Hi, good morning, good day, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on cradle to grave oil management. Uh, my name is Andy Davis, and I'm a transformer oil services engineer for Dobal Power Test in the UK. Before we get started, I'd just like to give you some details about Altanova and how they fit in with the Dobal group of companies. Altanova operates out of Italy. They provide diagnostic solutions to a wide variety of companies to help them maintain and improve the performance of their electrical assets. This is achieved with the use of portable testing equipment, advanced monitoring systems, and a range of professional services. Altanova was formed in 2017 as a result of a merger between ISA Instrumentation and TechIMP, both of them working out of Italy. A couple of years after its formation, Intellisor joined the group, and in 2021, Altanova also became part of the ESCO family when it joined the Doble Engineering Company. Altanova joined Doble in 2021, and it follows a number of world-class companies like Morgan Schaefer to come under the guidance of ESCO Group, which Doble itself became a part of back in 2007. Doble now boasts over 100 years of service into the electrical industry and offers a wealth of support and experience to our customers. Altanova's reach now extends to over 100 countries, boasting 12 facility locations and over 150 employee employees. It's a growing network of sales partners and customers, and it demonstrates the strength of the brand and services the company is delivering. Altanova offers a range of solutions from provision of electrical equipment to professional services and monitoring systems. The service offering ensures asset managers can proactively look after their equipment using the very latest technology and maintenance tools. The testing and monitoring solutions cover a diverse range of electrical equipment types and voltage classes, from power transformers to rotating machines and overhead lines to the ever increasing necessity of battery storage. If any of these service offerings are of interest, please don't hesitate to get in touch for more details. Anyway, on with the show. Many companies have their sites now focused on fantastic new monitoring methods, big data and artificial intelligence. These data technologies providers are very useful, but without implementing robust maintenance, it's about as much use as all having Apple watches, but failing to exercise and eat healthily. We have all lost many of our older engineers to retirement, and the skills gap is starting to show. Universities are failing to provide our young engineers with the basic principles of oil management, which are critical to the longevity of our service assets. With this in mind, we'll take a brief look at the following topics to assist you in your cradle to grave oil management. There are an increasing number of liquid dielectric types on the market many bringing benefits like biodegradability and high flash points. But it all started out with mineral oil back in the late 1800s. It's been around for so long now that we understand very well how it behaves in service. We know it's capable of extinguishing arcs and being a liquid with a low pore point, it can move heat around easily to keep the windings cool. It stores fault data in the form of gases that can be used to identify incipient issues developing in the asset and can last for decades if it's being looked after properly. Unfortunately, it's not a perfect product. In the presence of oxygen, heat and light, it degrades, it's flammable, and of increasing importance in today's world, it's not biodegradable. It's a specialised product, supplied dry and free from physical contamination, its low affinity for moisture means it helps to keep the asset dry, but it also makes it more difficult to dry once the paper becomes wet. Storage, appropriate handling and intervening with good maintenance at the right time are key, key, key to keep the asset lasting for decades. Transformer oils are a highly specialised and dried product. Different oil types like esters, silicone and mineral oils are not compatible with each other and because there are now many different types 
it's more important than ever to know which oils you are using on site and how to obtain them. The company you purchased the oil from might not be the manufacturer, they may just be resellers. Even though the oil starts out as fit for purpose, how they store, package and distribute the oil can affect the oil's quality and its suitability for use in high voltage equipment. You therefore need to understand how your supplier operates as well as the oil type. You should vet your suppliers regularly and keep records of visits. Find alternatives if your current supplier is failing you. You can see in the picture that this asset is filled with Mydel 7131, which is a synthetic ester. Manufacturers are getting better at including this sort of information on the rating plate, but you may not always find the oil type on here. You might have to refer to other documentation or even take a sample to identify the oil type in your transformer. You'll also notice the cooling to the left of the Mydel is K-NAN rather than O-NAN. O in Onan is for oil, whilst K refers to the fire class of the liquid being greater than 300 degrees C, which is superior to that of mineral oil. The N refers to where the fans and pumps are, whether they're present respectively, and this changes to F where they're present. The A is for the type of external cooling, cooling medium, e.g. A is for air, but this could be W for water, for instance. Having selected and ordered your oil, it should come with some documentation detailing the type of oil, the filling dates, batch numbers, and the standard to which it adheres, e.g. IEC 60296 for unused mineral oil, and the specification of the supplied product. Be wary, wary of wording on these forms, will meet or will meet specification when not supplied with actual test values, as you can see on the right of this table under analysis. These values are confirmation that the oil quality is filling, and they can be used to verify that the oil has not deteriorated in storage or in transit with testing. It's also difficult to vet a reseller, as the majority of the quality control is under the supplier's control, so you will be missing key information if an issue arises. Keeping records is vitally important to establish a paper trial. In the event something goes wrong, being able to look back through your records will make the investigation process much easier and also shows you are compliant should the finger of blame be pointed in your direction. As a minimum, test delivery oil for moisture and breakdown voltage before signing for the delivery. If the oil doesn't meet specification or closely matches the certificate of conformity data, then reject the delivery, else it may contaminate your existing feedstock of oil. Once this mistake is made, it's difficult to establish if your oil storage facilities or oil supplier is at fault. Users of large volumes of oil may choose to opt for bulk storage, providing they are maintained and cleaned every three years or so using hot oil flushing and kept in good physical condition this will keep your oil in better condition than when stored in smaller vessels. There is also less manual handling and forklift operation, making it safer. Cleaning is usually easy as well by using a mobile processing unit to keep the oil and vessel in good condition, just like you would a transformer. However, cleaning with detergents or having people inside the vessel should be avoided unless the tank is so soiled that the oil processing alone would not be sufficient to clean the tank. Maintaining the bulk storage should be dealt with in the same way as a transformer, with visual inspections to inspect the tank and bund integrity, paintwork, gaskets, valves, gauges and breathers. Remember to temporarily remove or bypass breathers during filling or rapid draining to prevent damage to these components. Oil drums should be ideally stored indoors in a temperature controlled building and out of direct sunlight. Each oil type in stock is best stored on a separate fund to minimize the risk of cross-contamination and selection error. In addition, any bund spillage can be recycled rather than requiring incineration or the oil being lost to general oil waste. 
any water debris that collects on top of the drums should be removed as soon as possible rather than being allowed to settle and become difficult to remove, as you can see in these drums in the picture. They, they have been installed inappropriately and they're covered in dirt, damaged and stored in open to the environment conditions. It's unlikely the oil within these drums will be still within specification, despite the tamper steel seal still being in place. Drums will have a longer shelf life if they are stored on their sides with the bungs at the nine and three o'clock positions. However, as the drums are heavy, this will require the use of a forklift truck to maneuver them into position on the racking. Remember to use the first in, first out rotation of stock principle. Surprisingly, oil supplied in 205 litre steel drums is only guaranteed for two weeks. 25 litre plastic drums don't even come with a warranty. That doesn't mean you should discard older oil drums, but it does highlight the need to test the oil prior to use. Even out of spec oil can be used if it will be dosed for a mobile processing unit so that the oil's condition will be improved before put, being put into the asset. Freshly emptied drums in good physical condition can be reused for temporary oil storage. The drums should be labelled clearly for their intended purpose and records kept of use so they are used more, no more than five times. Check the condition of the drums before its use and discard them if there are any physical signs of a con contamination or damage. Store them as if they were drums of unused oil, as ingress of any physical contamination or moisture will con contaminate your stored oil. If the drum becomes damaged, rusted, the bung threads or gaskets are damaged or contaminated, then repurpose this drum for waste oil. Remember to keep records of use for your drum filling equipment as well. Use a minimum of 25 litres of clean oil to flush the equipment before filling and regularly service the equipment to keep them clean. Store the filling equipment away from sources of contamination and keep them covered when not in use. Replace or clean them when there is physical contamination and before use. In the real world, filling the drum in a dust and moisture free environment is impractical but there are ways to minimize the risk of contamination and you should utilize them. Keep the drum bungs in place unless the oil is being drawn or filled. Be wary of the bung condition and do not over tighten them. Use a torque wrench set to 27 Newton meters or a drum key to reduce wear and tear and also minimize the chance of injuries through the use of inappropriate tools like pliers or screwdrivers. Store filled drums appropriately and responsibly as oil under temporary storage is in service oil, so it's actually waste oil covered under the hazardous waste regulations. So store the oil on buns or in buns and, and, or a bunded location or cover the drum if they're left outdoors. In the top picture are some drum keys. They have the exact sizes required to open the small and large buns. And there's also a pin on them that helps remove the tab seal, which minimizes the chance of you cutting yourself on the sharp metal. The below picture demonstrates how oil should not be stored. They are in, inadequately labelled drums, there's no buns, they're not segregated, and other chemicals are stored in the vicinity, and the environment itself poses a contamination risk. For filling HV equipment, take time to check pumps and hoses used for oil management activities before use. If the contamination is so high that flushing with clean oil prior to use will not clean them, then they should be replaced. Any contamination of oil filling equipment will be transferred to the apparatus. So remember to take two sets of samples from the asset before maintenance and also test for the oil for topping up prior to use to ensure it's within specification. Taking samples ensures that there's a paper trail in the event the worst happens and will also help to identify where maintenance procedures can be improved. As we cannot rewind the clock after maintenance, the second set of samples allows a backup in case of breakage or the necessity to perform additional tests. Record all oil activities in a maintenance log and keep a local copy available for ease of reference.
samples should be taken at condition-based intervals. There is some guidance on sampling frequency within IEC 60422, but the exact frequency should be modified based on voltage class, the current condition of the asset, and its criticality. Sampling should be accompanied by visual inspection done at the same time as the sampling. Keeping good records of maintenance or loading profiles are fundamental to good condition monitoring and maintenance schedule. If you do own online DGA monitoring equipment, don't let this substitute for sampling activities. As listed in this slide, the benefits speak for themselves, in particular for reliability, safety, and of course, keeping insurers happy. The types of tests for monitoring the condition of your asset can range from DGA and oil quality to paper analysis with furans, methanol and ethanol, and carbon oxides. Some tests will be dependent on the presence of certain conditions or additives. There are some additional tests. sample. Clean or change your sampling equipment every time to prevent cross-contamination between samples. Keep your sampling points clean and leave them in as good as or better than for next time. Take time to clean valves from any physical contamination using a lint-free wipe and allow sampling and containers to acclimatize to prevent condensation from forming inside the bottle. If required, we can deliver a one-day theory and practical training solution to help improve your oil sampling technique, which reduces costly maintenance actions and repeat sampling requirements as a result of a poorly taken sample. Poor sampling take makes up the vast majority of bad data from the labs. So verify the data with a resample is always the first step when getting poor data back from the lab. Oil sampling and maintenance should not be undertaken with any fibre to producing cloths like the ones shown here. Their use should be prohibited for any activities involving oil handling. The fibres left behind from using these items can have a significant impact on breakdown voltage and moisture results, which can have knock-on implications and cost implications for the asset manager. Wiping down drums with fibre producing materials is going to leave fibres behind along with the chance that they will find their way into the oil and disrupt the quality of the sample. Whilst there's no truly satisfactory white material on the market, wipes made from 100% polypropylene with low linting properties offer the best protection. Kimberly Clark produced a wipe called Kimtech 7622. It's individually packaged to prevent the wipes in storage and shipping box contamination from cardboard which contains wood pulp fibres. However, these wipes are not as robust as rags for cleaning rougher surfaces. So cleaning these areas can be supported with the use of a small nylon or polyester brush. A clean and dedicated toothbrush turns out to be quite great for this task. The role of the sample container is to protect the sample from deterioration from extraction to testing at the lab. Not all containers are appropriate. Can you guess which containers are inappropriate in these images? The top middle picture is actually a sample received by the lab. Whilst it's in a dark glass container, it previously contained whiskey, the remnants of which will contaminate the sample. Also, the cap is not designed perhaps to be airtight, allowing gases to be gained from or lost to the environment. If you're taking DGA samples, then the most representative data will come from the use of a glass syringe. All other tests can be done from bottles like the ones in the picture on the bottom line. Because aluminium can be filled to the brim without breaking in transit, they also retain quite good DGA properties. 
but the sampling process itself being open to the atmosphere means several gases like hydrogen and oxygen will never be represented in what's, of what's actually inside the asset. Visual inspections are really helpful. They can help identify root causes in the old data that we get back from the lab. You should check the transformer's physical condition, take note if there are any leaks, check the tap changer position along with the recording, the drag hands and number of taps. Note the winding temperature indicator settings, the condition of the radiators, pumps and fans, and note any vegetation growth within the transformer pen which may interfere with the cooling of the asset. It's also a good time to use other devices like corona cams, thermal imaging equipment and PD services as corroborating evidence. Visual inspections can also identify poor housekeeping or equipment that needs maintenance or replacement. If we look at the housekeeping in the first picture, there are many issues in this picture. Poorly secured pressurised containers, a removed floor plate that has no barriers, there are trip hazards, some dodgy scaffolding, paint, chemicals, cables and rubbish lying around. In the right hand picture, it's unfortunately a common condition for breathers which they're, they're there to reduce moisture and uh, reduce the transformer openness. So it's important to keep these well maintained. In this picture, the gel needs replacing, and there's also evidence of gasket leach, leakage between the breather sections. There's no identification of new and spent gel colours, and the damage on the small tap changer breather has been taped up rather than being replaced or repaired, so you can't actually see the condition of the gel or the oil level. After we've taken our representative samples, packaged them and shipped them correctly, now the labs have total control over them. All our hard work can be undone by a poor laboratory, so audit them regularly to make sure they are providing the right service for your needs, as well as good data. Importantly, test their data annually with blind quality control samples called round robin tests to validate the quality of data coming out of the lab. In a recent study of just DGA on three laboratories, all three labs provide the DGA data outside of plus or minus 20% of the actual levels. This level of inaccuracy means ratio analysis can be invalid, which also means the interpretation and appropriate maintenance will be inaccurate. The picture on the right shows a buffer solution for acidity tests that I found in a lab during an audit. It was five years out of date at the time of the audit. Noble can help you assess your laboratory to check if the data is representative through the use of round robin testing, calibration standards, or on site laboratory auditing. In this picture, the carrier bus bottle was discovered connected to a DGA gas chromatography machine. It was using a helium xenon mix and it was being used as a carrier gas. For gas chromatography used in DGA analysis, Helium should be a minimum of 99.999% pure, also called grade 5, for such an application. DGA data will be useless with this carrier gas and may even damage the equipment. This quality of helium is about right for filling party balloons. Issues like this are widespread, so don't be afraid to change laboratories if they're not performing. The only way you'll know this is if you vet them regularly. When choosing a laboratory, you should also ensure they can perform your tests that you want, check the reporting format suits your requirements, get them to give you raw data to save on transcription errors when moving data to other formats, or have, lab, or have the lab import your data directly into your favourite data storage and visualisation tool like Morgan Schaefer's Inside View software. Doble has four world-class laboratories in the USA and another lab in Canada. They cater for customers worldwide. They are also ISO 17025 accredited across all the tests they perform. However, the problem with the current accreditation is that it focuses on correct procedures and paperwork rather than the accuracy of the data coming out of the lab. This means that many labs believe their data is good because they're accredited, but the data accuracy is very poor when they are vetted. This is why Doble works with laboratories across the globe producing calibration standards the labs need to ensure their data is accurate and provide support for equipment setup. We also arrange on and off-site impartial lab auditing, which includes result accuracy verification 
in order to help improve good lab practice and build trust in the data coming out of them. So on to inhibitors. As oil ages, it causes reactions in the oil to darken it in appearance, and the oil eventually becomes sludgy towards the end of its life. This sludge is like cholesterol in our blood vessels. Its buildup on the paper and in the cooling duct walls increases losses and restricts the flow of oil, increasing the chance of overheating. Inhibitors are sacrificial molecules that prevent or reduce the speed of reactions by attacking the reactive components in the oil that form as a result of the oil breaking down in service. They are essential for the longevity of the oil in service. All oils will have some inhibitor in them. However, most oils come with natural inhibitors, which are undeclared. But many oils, like Shell's gas to liquid oil or GTL, are dosed with a synthetic inhibitor like DBPC or ditertiary butyrapyrazole, and these are called declared additives. Natural and synthetic inhibitors work in the same way to stabilize the oil, and as can be seen in the above diagram, they, the inhibitor counters many of the degradation pathway steps, meaning the oil oxidizes much more slowly and is more resilient to heat. Knowing if your oil is inhibited or not is important to ensure the correct oil type is used to top the oil up to prevent dilution and reduction in efficacy of the inhibitor already in the acid. In the UK in particular, we have been reluctant to use inhibitors due to historical incidents like DBDS or dibental disulfide, or the presumption that the base oil was poor quality before the inhibitor was added, or concerns over having to manage multiple oil types. In reality, however, some countries like the USA only use inhibited oils from installation of the acid. This saves money by reducing maintenance intervention over the oil's lifetime. It can be used in sealed and free breathing systems and can even be dosed mid-life. However, if, if this is done, the oil should be in good condition to begin with. If it's aged, then the oil should be regenerated prior to inhibitor addition because the regeneration process will take the inhibitor out of the oil. At some point in a transformer's lifetime, intervention is more than likely going to be needed. However frequent this intervention will be required is dependent on how the transformer has been operated during its lifetime. The more stress it's seen in service, or the more moisture or oxygen that's present, then the quicker the oil will degrade and more losses will ensue. ensue. To combat this, there are a number of options like oil regeneration and oil changes. However, don't be tempted to process the oil regularly or just for DGA gas reduction unless the amount of gas present poses a risk to the asset. We need this data to accumulate over time to form trend analysis, and once we remove it by regeneration, it's lost. Oil maintenance is also not a magic bullet, and it's not risk-free. Problems can arise and often do arise from this activity. It is therefore vitally important to take samples and record in detail the operation and its achievements making sure it reaches the desired temperature to treat the issue at hand. Other oil, oil identifying steps can be taken to reduce the risk of misdosing and cross-contamination by having dedicated equipment for the oil type in use and labelling everything used in the maintenance of this oil type accordingly, including the transformer itself. When it comes to oil changes, oil will usually be removed into drums or a tanker. This can be achieved with or without mobile processing unit. However, better oil drainage and hot oil flushing can be achieved with a mobile processing unit to more effectively remove the residual oil from the windings and the floor of the transformer. Ensure the breather is removed for this process to prevent its damage, and where possible, backfill with dry air or nitrogen to minimize moisture ingress. If the transformer has any leaks, gaskets or other accessory issues, now is a good time to get these fixed. Remember to take oil samples before and after the work in duplicate. When filling the transformer back up, by far the best method is to pull a vacuum with a mobile processing unit to dry the windings, but also to fill under vacuum, as it improves impregnation of the oil into the windings and minimizes the chance of residual air pockets. However, even if a transformer has been rated for vacuum, 
it may no longer be suitable for vacuum due to deterioration or damage of the asset in service, or there are accessory changes to ones that are no longer rated. Assess each transformer on its own merits, and if in doubt, do not pull vacuum. It's much better to get the oil back into the transformer and to perform additional circulations of the oil than risk damage to the asset. When pulling vacuum, it is important to equalize the pressure across the barrier board to prevent damage to this component. Pulling vacuum might be the most effective way to dry the paper prior to filling. However, it is inherently dangerous. All personnel should be located outside the area and it should also be barriered off to prevent unauthorized access. Double check rating plates and paperwork to ensure full vacuum can be sustained. And if you can't pull full vacuum, it's not going to be effective, so don't do it. If in any doubt, contact the man manufacturer or design consultant. And if there's still some doubt, or there are obvious signs of damage to the transformer or accessories, do not perform this task, as there is no way of knowing how much vacuum the damaged compartment can sustain before it fails. Here is a short video from Mythbusters. They were demonstrating how a tank defect could affect the vacuum withstand of a container. Okay, so this isn't a transformer, but the principle is the same. The tank was first checked under full vacuum and found to withstand it. Then a defect was created and vacuum pulled again. This time the tank failed catastrophically at only 270 millibar. That's 500 times less than the 0.5 millibar achieved under normal full vacuum conditions. Imagine the risk of collateral damage to equipment or personnel if this happened during your maintenance. Unused mineral oil that we put into our assets is covered under IEC 60296, the new oil specification. Other oil types will have similar unused oil standards. However, as soon as the oil is put into the asset, it becomes classified as in-service oil. The oil now needs maintaining under IEC 60422 or equivalent standard. Once the oil is in service and then becomes removed from the transformer for maintenance activities, it is now classified as a hazardous waste, even for temporary storage and needs to be stored or disposed of in accordance with local oil legislation. Waste oil needs to be disposed of in a manner appropriate to your local legislation. This may mean you have to register onto a hazardous waste scheme, even for small volumes of oil. Larger volumes, for example, 3000 litres per year, may even require specific site licences. In order to meet the requirement of your local legislation, oil needs to be stored securely and somewhere safe in a bonded location. If your country has a PCB legacy issue, polychlorinated biphenols, like we have here in the UK, PCB content may need to be provided prior to collection. The storage containers need to be of sound construction, prevent leaks and also be labelled clearly with their contents and sealed with the correct bungs. The containers should be covered if left outdoors and stored in a way that prevents cross-contamination from other oils or chemicals or to the environment and also protects them from damage from moving equipment. The bun size you require actually depends on the size of storage container. Typically, a minimum of 110% of the largest container's volume. You must prepare consignment paperwork in advance of collection and use a specialist waste carrier for removal from site. The paperwork must be signed and retained for two years. If you're storing three kilolitres or oil or more at your place or location, you will need a site license to avoid penalty. Storage containers like IBCs should have the UN markings. This indicates they meet the required design standards. Waste oil is best stored like new oil or unused oil. However, it should be segregated to avoid cross-contamination with other oils and other oil types. There are numerous documents or standards available to assist with oil management. We've listed a few here for your reference. 
but you should also seek out local government legislation for your guidance specific to your location. I'm not going to go into listing these, you can read them at your own leisure. So to summarise, oils are specialist products. They need to be handled with care to retain their chemical, physical and electrical properties. Take samples at every opportunity. If in doubt, sample and test again. Mistakes are usually irreversible and they may even endanger life. Ensure any apparatus you use to take samples or fill equipment with is adequately clean and flushed prior to use. Take into account the size of pipework to calculate the most appropriate flushing volume. Label and discard those part used drums unless they will be used later for maintenance via mobile processing plant. As soon as you open the drum, you've lost the quality control, so always test the oil before use. Monitor and record your storage activity so that there is a paper trail in the event of an issue to help you find the cause of the issue. Sampling is going to be your best tool to identify incipient issues and get for good quality control of the oil. It's a skilled task, so ensure your engineers receive regular training to keep the data representative. Store and dispose of oil in accordance with the local legislation and use a licensed waste contractor to handle your oil and oil contaminated waste materials. That concludes today's webinar. I hope you found it informative and we look forward to welcoming you back after another webinar soon. If you need help or guidance with anything you've seen or heard in today's presentation, then please get in touch. If you've submitted some questions, we will do our best to answer them, either with our remaining time or through email afterwards. Thank you.